you are actually literally in a position to prevent the maiming of hundreds of millions of people at a minimum. That is an amazing amount of good. So look, I'm rooting for you, but by the way, Brett, I, I, there was I, there was um, a paper I wanted to bring up because I, I thought I, you know, it would be interesting just to give some people some tag on um, the, the seriousness of this level here, this serious of this issue, because you know, uh, this we're talking about sleep apnea, and we're talking about people whose faces don't grow well can get sleep apnea. And I, you know, maybe many causes of sleep apnea, but I deal with the structural element, you know, the structural cause of sleep apnea. A lot of people say that is the predominant cause of sleep apnea. And, you know, it's, they did a, this is a paper in Australia. Um, I'll, I'll send you the paper um, by, I can't even pronounce the guy's surname, the main author. Anyway, they, um, they looked at kids in the three to 12 years old who had um, sleep disordered breathing. So they defined these guys who, who were on a waiting list for adenoidectomies who snored. That was the criteria of, of where they classed them against normal kids. And these guys had a, a 12 point IQ difference. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 10 point IQ difference. And David Gazal has done other research, similarly showing where he took people, I think, in L.A. who had sleep disordered breathing out of class, offered them all corrective, you know, tonsils and adenoids, I believe, taken out, and then watched how they improved in school. And these are, they're, these are really massive changes. I mean, these aren't the difference between whether you send your kid to a state school or a private school. These are, these are in the region of whether you said send your kid to school at all. I mean, these are really big differences. And then I, I, I went and talked to an um, otolaryngologist, an ENT surgeon, and I said to him that I thought that I could argue that people with sleep apnea, um, it was damaging their health, and seriously, and 10% of the adult population in the developed world was going to die a decade early from sleep apnea and its consequences. Mm. And he says to me, oh my, it's more like 20%. That's a one in five. And then I'm looking at these two ends of the spectrum, and I'm thinking that from a structural perspective, if you've got good architecture from a young age, what we're talking about is something in the region of a 10-point difference in IQ points, something like a, 10, a decade more life expectancy. And during that life, you have th that longer, healthier, more intelligent life, you have a face that looks great. And yep. all the benefits that brings you. And yep. I know when I walk into rooms, because I've got an okay face, better than average because of the treatment I gained from my father, that I'm more socially acceptable. Yep. I get more responses. You know that's not fair, but that's the way it is. No, let's flip this one on its head. Yeah. There is a reason that human beings are so very sensitive to beauty. Okay. It has to do with the connection between that beauty and function. So it is not surprising that people are obsessed when they discover that you have a secret. Maybe it's a partial secret for people who have already suffered the consequences of a mal-shaped skull. But there's a reason that people are very focused on being more beautiful. That reason is downstream of the underlying ultimate evolutionary explanation for why we give a damn about this, that, and the other, right? We are, we are selected to pay attention to this characteristic because it matters. And so in some sense, what you have just described is the capacity of a human being to use proxies of facial structure to detect underlying health, right? underlying health, likely mental capacity. And so there's nothing about the story you've just told that I think is far-fetched in any way. The idea no. that your sleep and your intelligence are, are connected, that your sleep and your breathing are connected, all of these things make perfect sense. And so the amount of good that potentially comes from your fixing our understanding of this is incalculable. Hmm. But 
so too is the power that you're up against because of the narrow short-term interests of the people involved in dictating whether or not you're you have a strong case yeah 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 i mean here we go again you know right? the first time it won't be the last time so, by the way the, the quote i say on what you've just said is i think to a greater extent your face is the cv of your health beautiful it's a, you know, you're displaying, I'm displaying to the outward world that not only did I have the right genes, but I'm not saying genes aren't important. I had the right genes, but also I was able to elicit the right lifestyle, the right grit and determination, grit your teeth and carry on to develop a good face. Yep. And that's me. So it was not only just genetics, but it's I have manipulated my environment in such a way that I am demonstrating here for you that I did that. And because of that, I make a good partner X, Y, and Z. Totally. And the fact is, this is how sexual selection works. We mm. select mm. characteristics that are good proxies for underlying features that matter, right? You know, why, why do, uh, why are women so sensitive to, uh, whether a guy is funny, right? Funny is a proxy for a kind of insight, right? It's a kind of insight that allows a person to get farther in the world, to discover opportunities, you know, that exist, mm. that can't be seen by others. And so none of these things are idle. It's not, you know, it's aesthetic as a proxy for something deeper. Yes. And, what does good looking mean? Right. Good looking means that all of the things that, you know, yes, the genes have to be right in order to be good looking. It's not sufficient, right? If you take good genes and you put them in a bad developmental environment, it doesn't work out. No, if you start no. them, it doesn't work out. Well, so, but I remember going to a party and someone goes, Mike, you're looking healthy. And I go, you mean I'm looking good looking today? <laughs> right. Totally. Same thing. Different yeah. sides of the same coin. Facial yeah. health, you know, you know, you know when you meet someone and they look that sort of dour, sort of white shade, you know, having a terrible time. You see it in their face. Absolutely. You know, why wouldn't we? You know, why would this is you know the great way, the way you convey um, how you are, and that's important within a group. You know, you need to know you, we're not taking Bob hunting today. He doesn't look well. He doesn't look well. Right. Totally. You stay at home. We're, we are hypersensitive to these things for a reason. And we have, because it is possible to be superficial about this, and also because it is possible to cheat, you know, to the extent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what has the makeup industry been doing today? Right. Well, exactly. So you can cheat. And so we've lost the sense of these things as a proxy because it's become a kind of idle competition. But nonetheless, these were good proxies. And you have tapped into. I don't know, the mother load of good proxies, right? Because, you know, your physical health is one thing, but your face is a concentrated location of focus for yeah, yeah, it is. your whole perceptual yeah. apparatus is tied up in this. It is the indication. And as you point out, um, the, uh, the face is the key to how far you get in the world, how persuasive you are. It is. It's, it's shocking. You know, that research on um, how far, how much you, uh, more you earn, <clears throat> that prison sentence, you know, they did this wonderful study prep where they, um, they took trial lawyer lawyers, you know, judges who were making, deciding the sentence. So you, you've been found guilty, the judge has to decide the sentence. So they got all of these papers and the, the, each one had the photograph clipped to it. And then they just changed the photographs around. Same papers, they changed the photographs and they rated these people, you know, what's this guy like this, you know, you know, how long were you going to give this guy, you know? And then you had this, you know, this, you know, really, you know, either ways, the facial appearance and how beautiful they were ranked made a massive difference to the sentence these judges gave them. Right. Um, presumably <laughs> without changing the facts of the case uh, and therefore the guilt or innocence. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to go back and defend a term that I used because I realize it covers two things, both of which are relevant here. Oh, yeah, okay. I argued that people are being maimed. And I mean two things by that. Um, you tell me if I've got it right. 
One, there is the maiming that comes from a misunderstanding of malocclusion and therefore a um, extrinsic modification comparatively late in life. So for, in my case, the moving of my teeth through my jaws. Uh, had so the treatment. The treatment, right? The treatment is yeah. an active uh an active case but there's also and the one that i'm really referring to is the maiming that we do to our children by not recognizing that the the uh, resistance of their food is what dictates whether their jaws will form correctly whether they yeah, will yeah, but don't don't yeah. don't forget posture as well you know brett because a lot of people are getting blocked noses they're hanging the mouth open the tongue isn't on the roof of the mouth you know I, 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 harvold did some brilliant research in um, caltech all he did was put an uncomfortable piece of plastic um uh, with a bit of plastic, a sharp bit of plastic on the roof of these monkeys, you know, and the experimental ones, massive facial changes. Mm. The um, uh, controls, beautiful development, as you would expect of most little primates. And so, you know, the, where the tongue is, is the secondary um, factor, we think. And the two of them are the, the most important factors. You know, we go on to breastfeeding and in, um, um, early nutrition uh, as well. Those are all, in fact, important factors, we think. But clearly, we need spotlight of med modern medical research to shine on these areas. But the diet, we do think, is the most important. Right. Um, and, you know, we're not going to be able to get into all of the things that are potentially uh, connected, but because every system, you know, because the way you interact with your food, um, because of the interaction of breathing, the potential implications this has for allergies and things are are significant. And the, the, the effect, then, then a blocked noses and allergies are going to have on facial development because if you can't breathe out your nose, you have to mouth breathe, right. and that can become such a habit. And if you have this mix with these soft muscles, and uh, where's your face growing? Right, right. No, and it, I look in schools and yeah, I mean it's a you know it's a it's a classic. So just simply, so we're going back to what you were saying. We, we've got the, the harm from orthodontics that does. I mean, I don't want to cover that too much because that's where I get the most resistance from my colleagues. And you know, there are many great colleagues out there who are doing fantastic work. But we all know within the profession, there's some people sometimes causing significant problems. Yeah. And we talk about retractive orthodontics, and we know it happens. No, I think, um, you know, power-wise, it's a loser, right? The idea of people doing active harm, the pushback you will get is, of course, monumental. But the amount of good that you will do if you can modify the approach of parents to their children early enough in life that they prevent their children from needing intervention. That's really where the lion's share. Yeah, I, that, that's that's the kind of direction I want to go in now because you know, I've, 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 again, I've watched you. I mean, clearly, my ability to earn money with my chosen subject is not as transportable, is not as mobile. Particularly the systems I use. You, I, 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 you know, if I wanted to build my dream clinic, I would have physiotherapists. I would have. Um, uh, behavioral psychologists, um, you know, a multitude of different people, you know, because what I'm saying, you can, you can effectively say I'm telling people to stand up straight and shut their mouths and build their muscles up. So using oral appliances, yeah, that can help. But, in, you know, I'm trying to change kids from this to this, you know, standing up straight. So an oral appliance is one element in this broader change I need to do. But it, it's... You know, you, you, you can't just, I can't just say, I can't go on a plane tomorrow, fly somewhere else and work in a van. Well, no, that's not, uh, that's not where I see you. What, what I, no. win or lose, frankly, Mike, win or lose. What I'd like to see is you to write a book, um, how not to maim your children uh, to increase their earning potential and their IQs without even trying, Right. That yeah. book where you alter the diet of the child, the child sleeps better, ends up smarter, uh, marries better because they're handsomer, and that tells a potential mate that they're a higher quality uh, partner, right? That's a slam dunk. And, you know, you and I are both parents. You know 
how far out of your way you would go to improve your child's position in life, even just a little. And we're talking about a lot, right? Make your child oh, yeah, smarter, yeah, 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 handsomer. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. that's a winner. Yeah. Um, there was a, to remind me, it was a book called Why Raise Ugly Kids. Um, and this is, I'm trying to think this must be 50 to 100 years ago. You know, this, this really isn't new, this whole stuff. It's, there's a huge volume of information already out there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I should write a book. I mean, you know, yes, I don't relish, as a dyslexic, I don't relish the idea of writing books. It's, you know, an, an anathema to me, but you and me oh, I'm not reading them. <laughs> right.